Just to give you a little bit of background on Dr. Weaver, she's recognized nationally and internationally for her research on the effect of, the, of illness on the conduct of daily behaviors and assessment of treatment outcomes, particularly in sleep disorders. She is a professor of nursing and the chair of the Biobehavioral and Health Sciences Division at the School of Nursing here at the University of Pennsylvania. She also holds a secondary appointment in the Division of Sleep Medicine, the School of Medicine, also here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I could probably go on about her accomplishments, but I think we'll just let her get started. And an alum. And an alum. <laughs> The most important part. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Weaver. Thank you. And my son's an alum, so I had the privilege of watching him graduate last year. So this is kind of like a nice memory this year. And thank you so much for taking the time to join me this afternoon to uh, hopefully gain a little bit of knowledge about sleep. There's so much we could talk about, so little time. Um, and of course, uh, you may not be aware that, um, unless you've had a sleep study, that there's actually a couple tests to assess sleep. One is they put you in a room, and especially in the afternoon, and they turn down the lights and they see if you fall asleep in 20 minutes. So if I see you falling asleep, it's not because I'm boring, it's because you're sleepy. So. <laughs> but hopefully that won't happen. But as, um, you know, with all good, uh, courses here. I'm going to state my objectives and uh, what I hope to achieve is to talk about how we as a society have really changed our behaviors to affect sleep and that we actually are not obtaining optimal sleep. Talk about the physiology of sleep, the five stages of sleep, the impact on health and functioning, talk a little bit about how to promote good sleep which we call sleep hygiene. I wish we had a better name for it but we don't. So. Um, and that's what I hope to, to cover. We're a society where there's a fair amount of sleepiness amongst us. And so what I really hope to do is to demonstrate why that's not really a, re a good thing, both physically, mentally, and also for the safety of yourself and others. So let me back up and let me just give you another example of uh, an everyday situation that occurs that demonstrates uh, some of the pressures that we're on regarding sleepiness. So there's a, a, this young lady, jo Joanne Gonzalez. She is a suburban housewife, stay-at-home mother, kind of a Martha Stewart example, very much a perfectionist, starts her days at 5.30 a.m., and she kind of ends them whenever the work is done and the stimulants, particularly coffee wears off. She gets up after awakening, she starts her first loads of laundry, sees her husband off to work, fixes breakfast for the kids, herds them into her Volvo, and off to they go to lessons and camp and after school activities. She, she comes home at night, makes dinner for the family, but nothing for herself. She's too busy, she's too harried, got to get the kids homework done, got to get them into bed. So not until about 10 o'clock when everyone else has settled down and the house is finally quiet does she really get a chance to do any relaxation. But a relaxation really isn't relaxation. This is the opportunity to do things because the kids aren't around. So she mops the floor, she does her email, and so around 2 a.m. she crawls into bed and starts all over again. That's not good. We're in a chronically sleep-deprived society. There was a wonderful series of articles in the Time Magazine some time ago that really described this. And of course, it's interesting that um, Thomas Edison felt that he didn't really need sleep. He said, personally, I enjoy working about 18 hours a day. Besides the short cat naps I take each day, I average about four to five hours of sleep per night. And I hope by the end of this, you'll realize that's not great. But the key is not that he slept so little, but that he napped so much. And the reason he napped was because he slept so little. And who knows what he would have invented if he'd gotten enough sleep. He said, time is really the only capital that any human being has and the thing that we can least afford to waste or lose. And that may be true. But I also hope to convince you that sleep, like nutrition and other things vitally important to functioning, is something that we can't shortchange. That we will pay for it in, in the end. And in fact, as a society now, we get about 20% less sleep than our ancestors did 100 years ago. They'd go to bed when the sun went down. They would get up when the sun went up, when that was about 12 hours of sleep. They might get up in the middle of the night, go in the kitchen, meet their other fellow housemates, 
have a bite to eat, go back to bed, but they slept for longer periods. And over time, the amount of time that we have spent asleep has gotten shorter and shorter. And now in the electronic age, it, it was 24 hour society, had, that, that we, we tend to do that even more and, and feel that it's a disposable, I call it the tossed <laughs> necessity, or the disposable necessity. People think that we don't need it. And, we, and it is a sign and a badge of honor to say you only got three hours or two hours of sleep and you're doing really well. Now, I do a lot of these presentations. I do a preceptorship for the college students. I love to razz them and I really gear this towards them about the impact of lack of sleep on their grades. But in fact, um, they oversleep their alarms 50% of the time. And if you oversleep your alarm, you're, that's another sign you're excessively sleepy. You should actually wake up just prior to. And myself, being a sleep researcher, I, I, I follow the rules, and I usually do wake up prior to my alarm. I don't even know why I even said it. Um, but, but if you get a sufficient sleep, you will wake up spontaneously before that. So really, life, the philosophy now in our society is life is too, sh is too short, and so we rely upon other ways to keep ourselves awake. Uh, we use caffeine. We also, I don't know if that shows, I guess it shows. The thing that just, I just cringed when I saw this on the web, that there's actually a t-shirt that kids can get to really show that, what, you know, this, this machism that, in fact, they can do without sleep. Um, and, and it's advertising um, something like Red Bull that, that has a lot of caffeine in it and energize you. When I was growing up, we all went to bed and I'm sure several of you in the same case, um, you know, when the, when the um, what did they call that? You know, all the, stage, the, the test pattern came on. And we went to bed. I thought, why are my kids sleep, you know, up later? And, and I remember everyone as a family went to bed at the same time. I thought, because, because they're entertained, because there wasn't, there's no test pattern anymore. There's all these night late shows. Now there's what, three series of late? There's late, 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 and late, late, late. And, and, and so there's constant entertainment. Um, and our kids are watching them too. TVs in the bedroom, computers in the bedroom, um, and, and of course just um, all this stimulation before going to bed. Uh, and of course the, the end result is a society that is excessively sleepy and I hope to show you why that's not a good thing. Now this is kind of an interesting slide I borrowed from my colleague David Dinges. I have a number of his slides in here. And so really um, as we have light and dark, as I pointed out about our relatives in the past, it really shaped our genes, our biological system to be awake at a certain time and asleep at a certain time, the circadian rhythm, which I'll, I'll share with you. But in fact, modern humans develop technologies that have really shifted that. And if you look at the area of the East Coast, you can see that it is dark, but it is not totally dark, it is light. That all those lights are on at a time when it should be totally black. Now, of course, as you look at other areas of the world, it is darker. Now, of course, it could be more sparse areas of the world. But in fact, when you look at this globally at night, um, which I'm sure our astronauts are doing that now, that in fact, there are a lot of lights on because we're still going, going, going instead of being in bed asleep. So, as I said, Part of it is the availability. Star it's all Starbucks' fault. They're the ones who got us in this. <laughs> They're the ones who tempted us with those lattes. Um, but again, the drug of choice, um, Joanne Gonzalez, the example I gave you, was caffeine. We all grabbed that fix, be it coffee or, or, or a diet Pepsi, but about 60% is our caffeine of choice. 167 million caffeine drinkers in the United States, which is about 6.3 billion gallons of caffeine. And we used to start with these, what happened to the little cup of coffee? It just disappeared. There's no little cup of coffee. I mean, I like a little tea, and they give me this thing, this big, I said, no, I just want a little cup of tea. And of course, what was the norm, this small cup of tea is now the 16 ounce cup or the 22 ounce cup. And um, additionally, we have it in, in a, so the little cup then became the 20 ounce cup. And really, the average drinker drinks about three cups of coffee a day, uh, 2.4 billion cup gallons of tea, and about 70% of caffeinated or, or carbonated drinks are caffeinated. And we consume about 15.3 billion gallons 
um, or 574 cans, 574 cans for every man, woman, and child. That is a lot of caffeine. Um, and you really shouldn't be drinking caffeine after noon, you know, how, with the horror of believing that for all of us, but in order to really work through your system and go to sleep. And we can become addicted to it, so we get these caffeine withdrawals when you, when you do without it. Um, the other piece is that now that we have the technology of email and web-based um, possibilities and now tweeting or twittering or whatever <laughs> we can do now, the relationship between sleep and work. And as you can see by this slide, that as there is an increase in the number of hours people work, something's got to give, and what gives is the amount of sleep that they get. And I will show you evidence that being at this end is not a good thing. Um, and so there really is this nonlinear relationship, but nevertheless, it's really not great that we've got a fair amount of people who are getting less than eight hours of sleep because of their work patterns. I hear of people waking up, um, especially brokers in the middle of the night to see what the Japanese market's doing. I thought I should put in a Wharton-related comment being here. But I mean, that kind of 24-hour attention to one's work uh, certainly decreases sleep. On the other hand, when given the, op the opportunity to sleep on the weekends, they don't always do that, they get more sleep, but again, um, and I like to show this to the students, that the more that we, hours of relaxing and leisure um, also um, affects how much sleep. So, so in addition to working a whole lot, if we play hard also, we're not getting sleep either. We sacrifice no matter what. I think all, all throughout the campus, it's an issue that we are just now understanding we know that with young children, for example, in school start times, there's been research to show changes in grades when you push for high school students, you push the start times back to allow them to get more sleep. So I think we're just starting to realize the impact. You just tell him he will also gain weight if he doesn't get enough sleep. There's a relationship between the short sleep duration and weight gain. So if you start to hit things that they value, um, then I, I think it will make a difference. The other thing that I want to point out um, for those of us who are also caregivers, that the, for more individuals for which you provide care, this is for some of us, um, particularly women, the second shift when we get home, that in fact when we take on several caregivers in a typical family where we're the caregiver for several people, I should say, that in fact our sleep is also shorted because we do go to work, we do that, then we come home and do all the other activities pertaining to the, that care of our families and that decreases our sleep as well. So now let me try to portray for you a little bit more about what sleep actually is and why it's important. Well, we don't know what sleep is. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Little teaser there that I couldn't fulfill. We know what it what it looks like. We don't know the purpose of sleep yet, which is um, another area of research. It's, I love doing sleep research because we have so few answers that it keeps me funded. Uh, but um, <laughs> not easy to do in the last administration, let me tell you. Um, but in fact, it's a behavioral state. We know it's not coma because you can wake up. And that, so it's a, really a subtraction definition and, and not much more, but it is a, it is a retreat from environmental engagement um, and there are key physiological behavioral processes that occur that I'll share with you that we know occurs during this time period and, and it is reversible so we know you're not in coma. I hope you feel good about that. Now, how do we know um, that you're in sleep? Sleep is defined by polysomnography. Um, that is a method. Has anyone had a sleep study? Yeah, you did? Okay, a few of you had. It, it, it looks worse than it is, huh? Except you're, you're sleeping all wired up, figured, literally, not figuratively. So usually, typically, as pictured here, the individual has a series of electrodes that are attached to their scalp. This it gives us the brainwave information because we know the brain is very active during sleep and changes as you move through different t stages of sleep. We also take a look at breathing for uh, respiratory disturbances, particularly for sleep apnea. So there's a little um, nasal pressure device that it's like two little prongs that go in your nares. 
Uh, the other thing we, we do is uh, place electrodes on either side of the eyes to look for eye movements, which depict certain stages of sleep. So that's the electrooculogram, brain waves, the electroencephalogram. And then we, uh, there are also electrodes that could be put that are placed on the chin or placed on the calf muscle that shows um, whether there's muscle movement because there's different stages of sleep where we don't have muscle movement and that measures, uh, that's the electromyogram that looks for muscle tension. And so we record all of these things at the same time. We used to have to score them by hand and one sleep study would be about this wide and about that thick. And you go page after page after eight hours of reading these. Now it's all done by computer, thank heavens, and they score it and usually the physician and the technologist look over it and finalize the interpretation of the sleep study. So we define sleep by stages, what stage of sleep you're in. And this is all based again on the, this information we receive and the characteristics that appear in non-rapid eye movement as opposed to rapid eye movement sleep. There are four stages of what we call non-rapid eye movement sleep where we have no eye movements. I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. And then rapid eye movement sleep you might be familiar with is predominantly where we dream. Although you can have dream and non-rapid eye movement sleep as well, most of it is concentrated in, in there. And I said we differentiate that by the parameters. So you start out uh, moving left to right in the first stage of sleep. This is when you're first starting to go to sleep. It's a transitional disengagement from the environment. You're just starting to doze off. You might still be aware. You might have some fragmented thoughts, a little kind of dreamlike kind of experiences. And your body starts to slow down. Your breathing starts to slow down. Occasional little muscle twitches. And it accounts for about 4 to 5% of your sleep. And of course, when you look at it, you see that the voltage on the brain wave is very low, but the speed is very fast. Okay? Stage two is characterized by two things. Stage two is characterized by these kind of funny looking waves called K-complexes, or these funny looking things called spindles. So as soon as we see those, we recognize that you're into stage two sleep. Stage two sleep is a big chunk of your sleep, about half your sleep. It's where your, everything really does start to slow down, your breathing pattern, your heart rate, your muscle activity. And we also um, are able to look at, for example, circadian rhythm because of body temperature, which also changes with sleep. And you begin to emit heat, your body temperature starts to decrease throughout the night, but starts around stage two. So stage three sleep and stage four sleep, we kind of lump together. This is deep sleep. This is when the time when your body begins to regenerate, particularly physically. This is when growth hormone is emitted, a lot of other hormones are emitted, um, and we recognize uh, these two stages of sleep. Stage three, you can see that in fact the voltage is getting higher and the speed is getting slower. The brain is starting to wind down. And we call these because uh, we call these delta waves. So when we start to see these waves, we say you're in stage three sleep. And when they're more predominant, we say they're in stage four sleep. By this is real your deep sleep, very rhythmic movement. Your body's very relaxed. And then, if you see, we move into what here is characterized as stage five or rapid eye movement. So one through four is non-rapid eye movement, and stage five, that's where the action begins. That's rapid eye movement. So I like to think, perceive rapid eye movement sleep, or stage five or REM sleep, as a time when the body begins to digest the activities of the day, like you might do in your email or your folders in your computer, and say, I want to keep this information, but I want to discard that. And I want to deal with this stress and remember this information, but the rest I can discard. And what I want to keep, I want to put maybe in more long-term memory. So it really is a time they process, the brain processes the events of the day. And there have been studies in animal models and also humans. They had little rat rodents and they trained, you know, they, they put them in a maze and they see how they did with their memory. And, and really the little mice that got more sleep did much better in the maze 
also know this from a, a study in Germany on a mathematical problem. They gave them the problem that was really kind of difficult to solve. And they worked really hard at it and they couldn't quite get it solved and everyone went to bed and, and the group that had the eight hours of sleep, during the sleep, when they first woke up, they knew how to solve the problem which told us that during sleep is not a benign time, that the problem solving continued and actually was completed during sleep and not while awake. I got my best, my first um, grant from, uh, big grant from NIH. I had a problem that the reviewers of the, the first time I submitted the proposal came up with something that really our own pr previous data that we had, our preliminary findings, shot us in the foot. And they said, well, why are you bothering with this? Why don't you just jump ahead and do this other thing? And I knew that wasn't the right answer. I knew that that other second step had to be taken, but how do I, I can't argue against myself. Someone else I could definitely shoot down. But I'm not, you know, it didn't serve me to shoot my own data. I went to bed 3 o'clock in the morning, wouldn't go. Got the answer, got the grant. So it's the time when the, when the brain really does work things out. So, yeah. All right, so, so usually uh, we cycle through this four to six times a night. There's 60 to 90 uh, cycles. So you'll go through one, stage one to five in an orderly fashion when you first go to sleep. Then you'll bounce around between stages throughout, but from early morning hours on, four or five o'clock in the morning, so you'll have more rapid eye movement sleep than you will have non-rapid eye movement sleep, and this is when you have more of your dreams. If I were to wake you suddenly from rapid eye movement sleep, you probably could tell me about the dream you had. If, and occasionally, if you slowly wake up, you might remember the dream. But most often, we do not remember our dreams. Because when we wake up, we slowly come up from stage five and work backwards. But other than the beginning and the end, unless we're abruptly awakened, for the most part, we bounce between stages. And so when you look at this, it, this rapid eye movement sleep is about 20 to 25 percent of your sleep time. And as you can see, it's really a mixed group of waves, both fast and slow. And that, and there's also rapid eye movements. You see, we can see on, on uh, the monitor that the eyes are moving and rolling, and that only occurs in this sleep. And the reason we have these mixed brain waves is the brain processing the information, the dreams going on. Imagine if it's a really wonderful dream. I was going to say hot dream. Your eyes are really going in your EKG. <laughs> but it, you're processing this information. The other thing that occurs in rapid eye movement sleep, something that was um, um, uh, the, the discovery of this was greatly contributed uh, by Adrian Morrison in the vet school was that uh, we are actually paralyzed during rapid eye movement sleep. Only our diaphragm and some of our, of course, essential body parts are, are operating, but the rest of the body is paralyzed. Now, when we wake up, we move back through these other stages, so then we're not paralyzed anymore. But there is something called REM uh, sleep disorder where the person actually, you might have heard about, I'll get you I a mean, night walking, um, night talking, um, uh, also um, night eating where people get up, they go to the kitchen, make themselves a sandwich, they eat it, they go back to bed, they're sound asleep. And of course there's been some isolated stories of individuals who have committed crimes, murder, and they're asleep. They go, there was one famous one in Canada, the guy got in his car, drove his mother-in-law's, shot her, got back in the car, drove home. He was acquitted because he had a sleep disorder. So there is something called REM behavior disorder where people act out their sleep, and I wouldn't suggest it, don't get any ideas. But the reason, <laughs> the reason is because some of the neurotransmitters that prevent you from, from actually moving around, the chemistry in the brain is defaulted in these individuals. That enables them not to be paralyzed. But the rest of us, uh, except for an occasional movement to turn, are, pr are pretty paralyzed during that stage of sleep to prevent us from acting on all those thoughts and, and stress and thinking and dreams that we experience. And people with REM uh, behavior disorder will, in their, you know, in their sleep, they might, uh, you know, some have even, you know, said things or, or physically um, attack their bed partner because, they, you know, 
from, from things that, are, that their brain is going through, but they're sound asleep, they're unaware of it. As you move through, this is hopefully where we are here, <laughs> awake and conscious. And, and so um, in the behavioral state of being awake, we can acquire information like you are all doing. Um, you are animated, you've got, your thought is logical and progressive as your questions indicate. Um, your movement is voluntary, and this is what your, your EMG, again, that's the muscle, active. Your EEG, the short, fast waves are indicative of wakefulness. That's part of the problem. If, if I were to look at an EEG without the eye movements, I could not tell whether it's an EEG of someone awake or an EEG of someone asleep. The only thing that helps, we're looking at the eye movements and the lack of muscle tone that occurs which you see here. So maybe I should go across and set it down. So in wakefulness, the cognitive experiences is you're gaining information. Here, you've got some processing of information. And in REM sleep, as I said, that's where we start to toss and, and keep information. So it's the integration of information, the meaning of information. And that's where the dreams are associated. The, con the sensation then is interaction with the environment. Here, of course, it's, it, it, you're, you're withdrawing from the environment, so it's more dull or absent. Here it's, again, vivid, that relates to the dream, but it's internal. It's not in relationship to the environment. Um, thought is logical here. It's um, less so in non-REM sleep, and then it can be illogical and bizarre, and that gets, again, to the dreams. Movement is voluntary. Here it's episodic. That might be the, uh, you can have dreams at any parts or fragmental thoughts during different stages of sleep, although predominantly non-REM, and you can have some leg movements. Um, or, you know, you're, you're, you're turn, getting yourself into a different position. But as I said, that when you get into non-free, it could be commanded, but it's inhibited. And that's the subtle difference. In REM sleep, we have the neurotransmitters that, that say, don't move and make us paralyzed. But in some pa in parasomnias, which is a sleep disorder, that doesn't happen. And that's what gets the sleep talking and the sleep walking and things that should be inhibited, but, but they're not. You can see the differences, which I've pointed out before, in the, the muscle tone. The muscle tone is much uh, less in REM sleep. It's, it's very, very flat. The EEG. These, these, saw, these sawtooth waves, very, very slow, the uh, peaked waves. Here it's a combination. And then eye movements uh, are occurred. This is an eye movement during the wake, not at all during non-REM. And then you see them again during REM sleep. So we look for this, and we look for this, because this looks just like that. So we don't know if it's awake or asleep. And we say, aha, they're in REM sleep. Um, and those of you who have animals, they pr produce this kind of funny thing on um, EEG. But then here are some, this is norepinephrine and serotonin, 5-HT, and you can see that REM is off as, and your eyes are open or moving, or as we get to REM, more rapid. But you can see that this hormone is emitted, and as you move into REM sleep, that's turned off. And this um, cholinergic system, these other neurotransmitters are emitted, and they kick on and put you into REM sleep. So there's a, that's why you see the changes in the, in the EEG and the other aspects of this because of the neurotransmission. And we are still trying to understand that. So you're asking good questions. We don't always have the answers. Physiologically, we also change during sleep. So if you move again from um, left to right, you can see that even though in stages one and two, things start to slow down, your blood pressure starts to decrease, your heart rate decrease, your breathing um, decreases, and the same with stage three and four to a greater extent, and there's a lot of fluctuation in REM sleep. And that is uh, what you pointed out in terms of uh, cardiac events and other things. You have a fluctuation of heart rate, so if you are predisposed to cardiac problems, that's not great. And that's when people can have the heart attacks, um, is that this occurs, especially we see this in patients with sleep apnea, where there's also a decrease in oxygenation that has occurred all night long. 
and then, in, and then this added stress occurs physiologically and they have the heart attack or the stroke. The respiratory rate is irregular, fluctuations in blood pressure. They have more apnea, which is the absence of breathing um, that occurs um, uh, less than five times an hour in a normal person, but can be as much as 60 times an hour or 300 times a night in someone with sleep apnea. And of course, the other part is that our response to decreases in oxygen and increase in carbon dioxide is also changes as we move through sleep. And it's more blunted, so those people with asthma or pulmonary problems will have more difficulty um, when they wake in the night. We also clear our secretions less, so in the morning you might have more difficulty breathing than you would when you went to bed. Is your question? All right. And this was a question I think someone asked, and that your Alzheimer's question got to remember the question, is that as we age, our sleep also changes. There is more difficulty um, getting to sleep, so you get more stage one and stage two, uh, less stage three, four sleep and REM sleep, and there's also more difficulty maintaining sleep and a lot of early morning awakenings. In Alzheimer's patients, they, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, there's a shift in their normal rhythm, so they tend to wake up earlier and, um, and have more fragmented sleep. So as you get older, these are the stages of sleep, these are the hours of sleep. You see a normal adult, this is the moving through the, the stages of sleep we talked about. This is called a hypnogram, the plotting of the sleep. And as you can see then, they, there's this movement through the stages. And then as you get towards the early morning hours, which was your question, I think, you can see you get more REM sleep and, less of the, and, and deeper stage uh, three, four sleep that occurs um, in, in these hours than previously. Does that help you? And, but in the older person, there is more disruption. That doesn't mean this occurs in everybody, but the tendency is that um, there is less sleep consolidation um, than, than normal. Um, and we don't know if that's okay or not. It may be perfectly fine. So I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, I'm older, my sleep is terrible, and I'm not going to make it. Uh, that's not the case. We just don't know. We also know older persons are less, are more resistant to sleepiness. So we don't know the meaning of these things. We just know that they occur. Now that brings us to, again, answering the questions about the other piece of sleep beside the stages of sleep, which is a circadian rhythm. So we have rhythm. And I like this cartoon because <laughs> If you've ever had a teenager at home, back to that other gentleman's question about getting his kid to bed, is that they're on a total different time cycle than the rest of us. And um, I, there was another cartoon I, I meant to scan where the, it's, the, you see it's a classroom, you look out the window and it, the moon is out and the teacher's got this chalk on the board and he's falling asleep. And, they, and they, the teenager in the class, he says, you know, algebra makes a lot more sense at this time of night, you know. <laughs> and, and that's true here. Here, the, the kid, I remember doing, I remember summers like this, oh my gosh, where, where she makes a big deal of the fact that he's finally up and it's noon. And she says, what's the big deal? You made it for lunch at last, you know. Bring in the news people, send over a crew, he's awake. And of course, the kid responds by saying, it's not summer unless your mom is ragging on you about your sleep has it. And that's true. I remember having I have two sons at home, you know, asleep when I, you know, they're still asleep at one, two in the afternoon. It's like, they have breakfast at two. They come in and they raid the lunch meat. That's why I was like, oh gosh, you know, what have I done? But part of it is um, related to this rhythm. So on, on the left is our, this relationship between sleep need and the normal rhythm. So in fact, we have a normal process, which is you see that sleep, the red line. That is, and I hesitated to lecture at this time of day. This is not a good time of day. <laughs> you see, <laughs> as we hit the circadian dip about this time of day, which is right here, and you see the time, you look at the clock, and this is not good. I don't teach in the afternoon for that reason. No, I actually do. but. It's with great trepidation because we have two pushes for sleep. One, as you can see here, it starts about, about 8 o'clock, about, about 7 o'clock, uh, melatonin is excreted. It starts, melatonin doesn't produce sleepiness. It starts the whole cycles of chemical changes that 
promote sleepiness, we start to settle down and all those changes that I mentioned, we go into sleep, that urge is still there, and then as we get towards the morning and we replenish that urge, then, then we start to move towards wakefulness. And it's this balance between the urge to sleep, the, the, we call it sleep pressure. So this is a normal rhythm. And you can see that, that as the, during the day, the sleep need, need builds, and it corresponds then to the circadian rhythm. And as I said, we have this, this not only the nighttime need to sleep, but a dip in our urge to sleep about this time, the siesta time, where a little nap would be a good thing, where we get a little bit more sleepy. And I know if I hang in there till 6 o'clock, I bounce back up and I'm ready to go. It does correspond, as you can see, to body temperature. So that's why how we plot circadian rhythm is with temperature. And it corresponds beautifully. People who are, because we, our rhythm is not only based on our biological clock, there is an area in the brain called the suprachiasmic nucleus. It's in the hypothalamus where the major clock is, although in all the cells there are clocks. And not all the cells, I should refer, there are cells who, that are also have clock properties of timing of things. But that is, is one of the major areas. It does start to lose some of its cell and capacity as you get older. I think that's why I don't respond to jet lag like I did when I was older. That's a good thing because my clock doesn't know what. I was in Vancouver yesterday. It doesn't know what time I'm on, and it cooperates better that way. Um, but people who are blind, their rhythm moves every day because they, we also not only have the clock, but we use light entrainment to center the clock for the appropriate season and time. And so, um, unlike animals that just use light, we use a combination of light plus inherent rhythm. But as I said, someone who's blind, they don't have that. Or someone who is, in, we know in community dwelling elders who are in the house a lot, they don't get enough light to keep their rhythms. And that's part of the problem, especially with Alzheimer's. And so you need some of that light entrainment to maintain your rhythm. So this is another way of portraying this. Um, the, the green is what's desired. Now, in the older individual, this is where the Alzheimer's comes in. Not for everybody. Don't take this home as it means everybody. But we know that there's a tendency in older individuals to have an ed a phase advance. Their, their rhythms tend to shift forward. So they may, you know, the, the, I remember in um, City Slicker, Seinfeld did this great, not Seinfeld, um, Billy Crystal did this great piece about, you know, uh, you know, as you get older, what happens, and that, you know, you start to having, you go and have your dinner at four or five in the afternoon, and then, and, and that's not too atypical, but there's this shift so that you get sleepy earlier, you may not go to bed, but maybe fall asleep in the chair, and, um, and then wake up earlier in the day. Um, like three or four or five in the morning, wake up early. And also with Alzheimer's, they tend to wake up uh, like three at night. And it's not some, or four in the morning, and, it, and it's not so much that that is negative to them. A cause of institutionalization is their impact on the rest of the family, who's now awakened and worried, and, and after a while, their own sleep deprivation and trying to care for these individuals is, is, becomes a problem. So, in older individuals, we see this phase advance where you become sleepy earlier in the evening and you're aroused earlier during the day. And, you're, and there's also a tendency, because the sleep is more disrupted, there's less, uh, more phase one, two, more stage one, two sleep, less deeper sleep, that there's also more sleepiness in the day and more napping. But not all older individuals are sleepy. A study that we did. Alan Pack was the principal investigator. I was involved in that study that showed that there are some older individuals who are not sleepy and very functional, and some older individuals who are sleepy and less functional. Um, some of it was due to sleep disorders. Some of it was due to medications. So it's very important to ask about medications that you're on because it can produce sleepiness. Now here's our teen, the opposite, delayed. So their sleep, this is our college kids, this is your son. So their sleep is phase delayed. So they don't think about sleep till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. That's when, and we know, we thought that was just a social thing, but we now know, due to work by Mary Carskadden and Brown, 
that there's a physiologic difference in their sleep and it's pushed back so that in fact they are when we when we're all trying to go to sleep around here they don't get sleepy too much later and they also don't wake up as earlier as we do so theirs is shifted so they may get sleepy about one o'clock in the morning two o'clock and then they'll sleep till 11 12 o'clock and that's physiologically normal for them that's why early classes my sons if they learned anything they learned not to take early classes and that's what they did they took three o'clock or or later classes or they didn't take them it was it killed them my son last semester at 8 30 or something it killed them but they purposely chose because they knew enough from hanging around me to go with the later classes not out of just experience but they also have heard me talk about this so that's that. Now, the other thing that disrupts our sleep is, is, um, is jet lag. And um, having, and of course, for each, each um, uh, hour, or excuse me, for each time zone you cross, it'll take a day to recover. So you can do the math. If you go to Hong Kong, you're in big trouble. You have to stay there for two weeks to get on schedule. Uh, but, um, and, and of course, um, Part of attending to that, melatonin helps a little bit, but part of it is getting out. If you're going west, you get out, you go to California, get out in that wonderful sun siring right away. The reason is to shift your rhythms back. With that light entrainment, you want to be able to shift your rhythms in sync with their time. So I try to get right outside. If I'm going to Europe, I go hide initially, depending on when I land, because if I spend a lot of time out in the daylight, I'm going to get totally screwed up because I need to shift my rhythms the other way. Um, shift work can be called the blue collar jet lag, but in mon this is scary. There was monitoring of 20 nuclear power workers. 25% were fell asleep on the job. Isn't that scary? 55% of night shift workers report nodding off asleep, and 30% have incidents occur three times a week. And this is again with these hypnograms. This is someone who's working, and you can see them falling asleep during the work. You know, here are episodes. This is their sleep, but these are sleep episodes while they're at work. This is 4 o'clock in the morning. And the reason for those episodes is because that circadian rhythm is pushing through. Now, we call these two pieces that work hand in hand. You've got the circadian rhythm, which is a biological rhythm, and then you've got the homeostat. The homeostat is what you all do to affect your rhythm. So it's how much sleep you got the day before. Do you wake up at a consistent time? Because wake up time consistency plays a role. You know, did you have that six layered pepperoni pizza right before going to bed? That will affect your sleep as well. So there's things, that, whether you have a fever. So there's things that, that affect the homeostatic drive to sleep, principally lack, uh, you know, the, this sleep pressure due to sleep deprivation. And then you have the circadian. And when they're both in sync, you're not going to be awake. It's going to drive you to sleep no matter where you are and what you're doing, and I will give you examples of this. Depending on how they're balanced, in night shift workers, they've got a strong circadian pressure to sleep, but they're trying to keep themselves animated. If you've ever been on a unit at night with nurses, they're very animated at night. They might play the music, they talk a lot, and they eat. And the reason is to keep themselves, they self-stimulate to keep themselves alert. So, what's the answer about how much sleep you need? Here is some data um, that shows what happens when these are, this is the test I mentioned, the multiple sleep latency test. This is how fast can you fall asleep? And you can see that, that, that you really stay quite awake, 20 minutes being normal. This is, this is um, during different periods of the day. This is getting close to night. So, that in fact, they're pretty good at staying awake. Um, um, and, and stay awake longer than even the person who has a normal night's sleep. But look at this with the sleepless night, how, you know, that's the homeostatic pressure to go to sleep. You can see that it doesn't matter what time of day. If, we, if it was circadian-based alone, you would see those changes over time. But it's both the circadian and the homeostatic pressure, the drive to sleep that intrudes in daytime uh, hours to force you to sleep. You just, you just can't, you can't control it. 
And so when we do this test, we put someone in a dark room with the electrodes on, and we say, we have two tests. One we say, see if you can stay awake, and the other we say, see if you can go to sleep. The one where we say, see if you can go to sleep, if you do it in less than 10 minutes, you're excessively sleepy. And you can see that these people, after a sleepless light, were very sleepy. But the other really wonderful work that's been done to answer these questions is done by David Dinges and Hans von Duncan here at Penn. David's in the School of Medicine. He's an experimental psychologist. He took individuals. He sleep deprived them over two weeks. Now, most of the work that had been done previous to that was on total sleep deprivation, taking all the sleep away. But what he did, he says, that's not what people do, except for teenagers on our, or college students on a regular basis. Most of us get partial sleep deprivation. We're sleeping five, six hours a night, and, and we do it day after day after day. Then what is the cumulative sleep debt that occurs? What does that do? And, and so this looks like a busy slide, but just hang in there for me. This is a cognitive behavioral test. In this test, we give you a symbol or a number, and you have to match it. There's about 90 on the page, and give you a minute and a half to do it. All right? Pretty simple. So if I give you a 1, you would give me, you know, the 10. If I give you the 10, you would write down the 1. So it's either all numbers, and you have to match this, do the symbols, or all symbols, and you have to put the number, depending on whether we're doing it on the computer or not. So these are three groups of individuals. One group got four hours of sleep for two weeks. One group got six hours for two weeks. And one group got eight hours for, for two weeks. And of course, in this test, the higher the score, these are the number that they got correct in that minute and a half. You see that there's a learning curve with this test, that they get better and better at doing it. And so you can see that when you look at this, this group, that they actually did better and better over time. These are the eight hours. Now you can see that over time, the group that got four hours of sleep really started to do a nosedive. Now you might say, of course, they only got four hours of sleep. And there was a statistically significant difference between those who got four hours and those who got eight hours. But the scary part was, look at the six hours. No learning curve. But there was, they didn't look like this, they didn't get better, and there was a statistically significant difference in performance between those who got six hours of sleep for two weeks and those who got eight hours of sleep, suggesting that you do need that seven and a half to eight hours. Another test that they did is called the psychomotor vigilance task. You can see the gentleman here with it. He's got his electrodes on so he can look at sleep. You don't need electrodes to do this test. It's a little box, and it's, it has no learning effect whatsoever. And, and, in, and in this little box, in this area here, there's numbers that flash and they roll, you know, sequentially. And as soon as you see them, you have to push one of the black buttons. L one button if you're left-handed, one button if you're right-handed. So you hold this thing and you wait. It's a 10 minute task, not very long, very boring. So we can unmask sleepiness for a, with a very boring environment in a very short task, doesn't take much. And as soon as those numbers flash, they have to respond. And you can see that over time, the eight hours did really well. And when they fail to respond, we call that a lapse, a lapse in attention. So this is a stained attention task. Look at the six hours. They get worse and worse and worse and worse. They've got a lot of lapses. A lapse means the numbers were there, but they didn't respond. They just totally missed it. <clears throat> Four hours worse, and this is what happens with no sleep at all. So not only can you not process information, you also can't sustain attention, which we think is really the fundamental basis for problems with sleep deprivation, is the inability to maintain attention. That affects your memory. That affects your performance. So what happens when we don't get sleep? I'm going to show you examples of this. It affects sleepiness. It affects your mood. Both ways, more irritable as also more depression. And we know from recent evidence that short sleep duration is associated with obesity. It's associated with diabetes. It's associated with cardiac events. Now, see if we can, if I can explain this to you. When you don't have a lot of sleep, with a high level of motivation, you're able to perform. And that's where to some students, you know, they think, I'm fine, there's your son, I'm okay. 
You can't perform. Sleep does not affect your hearing. It does not affect your vision. It does not affect your motor skills. You can still do all those things in a short period of time. But when I ask you to perform that task, if you're motivated in a short task, you can do it. However, if I prolong the task and I, and I really thrash the brain, to work optimally in a very boring situation where there's nothing else to stimulate you and to sustain your, intention, your attention, you're going to fall asleep. And so the effects of sleep loss permeates performance and both um, all cognitive and sustained attention tasks. And when we, I say the, this highfalutin term, sustained attention task, what does that mean? That means you're, you're going to crash your car is what that means. And it's the most, the most powerful determinant of lapsing and problems with performance um, is in a sleep imprint is how long you need to do the task. The longer the task, the more I'm going to unmask, as we call it, and show your sleepiness. Because you won't be able to keep it up. You could do it for a little bit, but not. So after about 18 hours without sleep, you can give your son these facts. Reaction time begins to slow from a quarter of a se second to a half a second and then longer. You can't, you can't make it go. You, you miss. You take longer to respond. Then what happens, you asked about what happens in the cell. What happens, I can't tell you, in the cellular level, um, uh, but we know that in a larger level in the brain is that um, the serotonin and, and other of those neurotransmitters I mentioned start to activate. And when they begin to activate, they intrude during sleep. So even though you could be at a circadian phase, which is the morning, and you're supposed to be awake, if your sleep pressure is high enough, it will create a situation where those neurotransmitters kick in, that flip is switched from awake and alert to sleepy, and sleep will intrude into the daytime. And you get these micro sleeps anywhere from 2 to 20 seconds where your eyes are open, you think you're awake, but you are not. Have you ever driven somewhere and then you're not sure how you got there? Yeah. Since we know that sleep uh, deprivation is detrimental, could you, before the session ends, tell us some ways to promote Yes. So let me move along so I can do that. So the other thing that to bring it home to your son, ask him if he'd go out and get drunk and drive, or go out and get drunk and go to class. He'd probably say, of course not. Well, maybe they'd say that. But reaction time is roughly the same as someone who's had 18 hours of sleep deprivation. The reaction time is the same as someone who has a .08 blood level, which would get you arrested in most states for driving under the influence. So there's been tests done where people drive through cones, sleep deprived, and those who have, have, have been drunk they had no problem getting people signing up for the drunk part. They found that, in fact, the performance was the same. All right, so what David says is that with two nights without sleep, your performance dramatically decreases and you essentially fall off the cliff. You just cannot maintain alertness. So let me explain. Oops. Oh, stop, stop. All right. So this is used as an EKG. Are we okay? I know we're running close to time. Or we're, we're, so, so an EKG, we just did this for, David did just for visual effect. So this is um, uh, the sound of someone performing that test, the PVT, and listen to the cadence of the response. Every time you see this, they've responded to the light, okay? Now, all right, all right. Oh, it's not going to do what I wanted. All right. Somehow, it, sometimes it gets a little messed up. What you would see plotted there under reaction time, that, that little extra little bit of um, labeling didn't come through for me. What happens is that then the, the, the performance is stable and reliable. You heard it. It was pretty much like a cadence song, right? So now here's someone who's had um, total sleep deprivation. Not doing badly. Getting worse. So, there we go. Where were you? 
So there are no lapses in the, the first person who had adequate sleep, but you see there were 33 lapses in the second person, and they got longer and longer. So for the short period, they sounded like the normal person. Boop, boop, boop. They're moving along. But as time on the task increased, their tired brain kept trying to compensate for the drive of push to go to sleep, and they couldn't do it. And they got worse and worse and worse. And, and this is only a 10-minute task. So we have 100,000 motor vehicle accidents every year because of sleep related. And, be, and that's probably underreported. You like my joke? I hope you read my little cartoon. That's underreported because a lot of police reports don't include sleepiness as an assessment for an accident. But Chernobyl, you guys are all like me. When I do this to the kids, they have no idea of these accidents I talk about. Chernobyl, that was due actually to sleepiness. Three Mile Island, they were up night shifts. I told you about the nuclear pile. Bhopal, Exxon Valdez, the combination of sleep deprivation and also um, uh, alcohol. And of course the Challenger, did you know that the, the commission said that the Challenger, one of the, the major reasons was, was fatigue by the group making the decision whether to launch. They were up for 36 straight hours. So, so all of these major accidents are due to sleep deprivation and we know that um, if you look at the troops here in Iraq they will sleep anywhere because they are so exhausted you know how many of you could fall asleep on concrete um, or the firefighters who are falling asleep with with fire just close to their head the uh, the grounded ferry the New York ferry that crash sleep deprivation hazmat truck and more recently who knows what this is Buffalo crash, absolutely. And what did we just hear? They hadn't had enough sleep. So I always want to go in and do a little Epworth or PVT on the flight crew when I walk on board a flight. <laughs> How much sleep did you get? I'm not in a, in a lounge. But it's serious. It causes accidents. And it can even cause accidents in your car. Here's a truck driving along at 60 miles an hour in a two-second lapse. It'll have a, a drift of a four angle drift, travel 190 feet, and be completely out of the lane. So if you think you're immune to it, you're wrong. Or your son thinks he's immune to it, they're wrong. Because the thing is, microsleeps do not let you know they're coming. They just come. If the sleep pressure is high enough, they're going to intrude into your daytime, cause you to, to, to fall asleep. Um, your eyes will be open, you think you're awake, but you're not. Your brain is asleep. And this could be into the other lane as well, in an oncoming accident. When you hear on the news, single vehicular accidents, I immediately say that's a sleep problem, especially at 4, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. That's why the rumble strips are there. To at least as you start to move out of lane, it jars you and wakes you up. Hey, these are time of day, but look at this. This is not rush hour. What's going on here? No. Two to four in the morning. What closed? The bars closed. And people are driving home, high, high circadian push, a little bit of alcohol, not a good thing. So what else is at risk? This is what you're talking about. This, this data shows that it also affects, this is chronic heart disease, a myocardial, a non-fatal heart attack, or a fatal heart attack. As you can see, this is the reference that as you move this way, it's, it's, the relationship between sleep duration and physiological events is a U. If you get a lot of sleep, that's bad. And most of the people who get nine hours or more of sleep typically are individuals who might also have some chronic other disease. But if you look at this, at seven hours, there's really not much of an increase in risk. 30% increase in risk at six hours, 80 to 90% increase in risk at, only, at five hours or less sleep. And most of those occur early morning. Diabetes. As you move to less and less sleep, you go from no risk to a 50 to 80 percent uh, risk of, of having diabetes. So it's not benign, this, this sleep. Um, also, sleep apnea as a hallmark of sleep deprivation affects relationships. Problems at work. Coworkers think that because they fall asleep in the job, the coworkers say, well, you must be lazy. 
They're not. They're sleepy. Marital problems. More individuals with sleep, di the sleep disorders, um, there was a high proportion of them who are divorced. They restrict their social life because they don't want to go out and be embarrassed and fall asleep. People think they lack interest. They have an irritable mood and impotence. And you could say to your son that you can't have good sex if you're sleepy. <laughs> That individuals who, who have, you know, I know from sleep apnea, they, they, we know that there's a 40%, well, part of it may be due to the hypoxemia, but they do have problems with impotency and sleepiness because they're just, you know, heck with a Viagra, get sleep. <laughs> so in general, it affects all different areas of life. The ability to be productive, I've shown that affects, again, the vigilance we talked about, but also that vigilance permeates all the activities of daily living from keeping your activity level you're keeping a pace with people your own age, being social, and again, intimate and sexual relationships are also affected. So to your question, what do we, the grand finale, what do we do about that? There are rules called sleep hygiene rules. I hate that name. First, regular schedule, even on the weekends. You maybe can deviate about an hour. That's what I do. But other than that, I can't, I can't sleep in anymore. Those days are gone. Um, because my sleep is so regimented, and I go to bed at the same time and I get up at the same time, that's why I don't need an alarm clock. And wake time consistency is particularly important. Avoid stimulants, especially a couple, as I said, ideally noon and on, but more so within two to three hours before going to bed. What alcohol does, it's not how much, alcohol puts you to sleep like this, you, you just go right out. But, you, but it causes sleep disruption and it won't let you get into those deeper stages of sleep it will prevent that and especially the more it drops to a zero level blood alcohol that's when it affects your disrupts your sleep the most so it's not how much you have on board going to bed it's how far you have to drop uh, throughout the night and as you move there it'll disrupt your sleep and it keeps waking you up you're not too alertness but it's like someone keep waking you up all night long that's why you feel so yeah in the morning after that sometimes with stress it's difficult to sleep. So it's best to set aside a time that's not right as you go to bed. Relax an hour before going to bed, either reading or watching, you know, something that's relaxing to you, yoga. Have a maintain your bedtime routine because we're behavioral individuals and if we go through the same process of I'm putting on my whatever you put on or don't put on before going to bed, I'm, you know, brushing my teeth, I'm doing this. If you do that every night, then as you do that, the brain says, "Oh, must be sleep time" and prepares um, for that. Again, we talked about a cool, dark room and the bed, this is again for more younger people, but could apply to anyone, that should be used for one of two things. <laughs> Sleep and other. But it shouldn't be used for watching long periods of TV, reading for long periods of time, or doing what the college kids do is they do their homework in bed. So then, for this actually promotes insomnia because the brain says, well, what is the bed for? Is this bed for sleeping or is it for homework? And it gets confused. So when you're in it and you think you want to go to sleep, it says, no, 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 you told me it was homework. The other thing that, that happens is if you keep changing your sleep time, I like to use nursing students as an example because they're, they're, they got these early morning classes that Monday through Thursday they're getting up early and they're going to bed fairly 11 o'clock or so because they have clinical, they really can't. Um, class is one thing, but when you're on the clinical floor taking care of people, that's something else. And they have to be careful. And what happens is they then comes Thursday night, Friday, it's the weekend, so they stay up late, they party, and then Sunday night, and this happens to a lot of us. How many of you sometimes have trouble falling asleep Sunday night before work? Because you've pushed your sleep back because you slept in, and the brain says, okay, which is it? Is my bedtime 1 or is my bedtime 11? Make up your mind. And it, can't, it, it just won't adjust, and it'll keep you awake. And then you have a harder time than um, continuing. Nap should be limited to, unless you're really sleep deprived, then, a good, then definitely get a good nap. But routinely they should be limited to about 30 minutes. The pizza refers to the decrease in GI motility um, when you're asleep. So if you have that big, reminds me of that, you know, those pictures of the snake who ate that big rodent and it's sitting right in the middle. That's what it's just sitting there doing nothing but reminding you on a regular basis that it's there. If you cannot sleep, turn the clock around. Looking at the clock, oh my gosh, it's, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep and I have a major meeting tomorrow. Oh my gosh, it's 3.30 and I can't sleep and I have a major meeting tomorrow. 
oh my gosh, it's 4 o'clock and I'm still awake. That just increases the anxiety and the adrenaline and it will keep and it will promote alertness. You want to turn the clock around, do not look at the clock. And, and it usually takes 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep and you will fall asleep. If you're, the best thing if you have trouble sleeping is get out of the bed. Don't stay in the bed. You don't want to associate difficulty with sleeping with the bed. Get out of the bed, go read, go get a little bite to eat. Little bite's okay if you're a little hungry. I always wake up hungry. Get a little bite to eat. Go to bed. That break is enough, you'll fall, you'll fall asleep. And I think there's just some website information about where you can get more information on sleep. Um, NIH has public access, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine as well. And um, NAPS is a wonderful area, and the National Sleep Foundation. Thank you. You have been a wonderful audience. Appreciate it. <laughs>